go away There's so much that needs to grow today Rain, rain, please don't go away I love H2O Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Master Rain Gardener Certification class. This is where we will teach you to design your own rain garden. By the end of our five part series, you'll have a rain garden all planned out for your very own yard. And this is our last session. This is class five. I'm Susan Bryan. I'm with Shannon Gibrandle, principal of Insight Design Studio here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Hello, Shannon. Hi. And also here today is, as always, Katie Wojtycek, our water quality specialist. And we have Master Rain Gardener students from this class who will be presenting their designs for their yard and their rain garden for us to discuss. And we will give them advice that they may or may not take. <laughs> so, <laughs> always feel free to not take our advice. <laughs> it's their yard. Um, all right, and so those uh, folks that are going to present their plans are uh, Diana Lundquist, Marilyn and Dave Wooten, Anna Cronin, and Emily Duthin. And these folks, I've sort of arranged them by soil, which is probably not a way they've ever been arranged before, um, but all the way from clay, the tightest soils with the slowest infiltration rate. Uh, Diana actually had an infiltration rate of more than three days, more than three days, and the water had not um, infiltrated, all the way down to sand. Emily Duthin was, it soaked in in less than an hour. So that's the sort of range of hydrology that we're looking at. And then also I, I talked, a little, or I wrote what sun condition they were, because those are really the two most important um, uh, parts of where what kind of plants you're going to pick for your rain garden is the hydrology, how much water, and the sun shade, how much sun and how much shade your site has. So um, we're going to, um, we'll start out with, uh, oh, and then um, also just looking ahead a little bit, I love this class because it is my, I get to see all of your good work and all of your interesting interpretation of um, how this rain garden is going to fit into your property, which is always different. Like each piece of property is very different. And then also each person has their own ideas about what's pretty and what's not. So I love, this is really exciting for me to see all of your designs. Um, and I can't wait to my, actually my most favorite part, which is to go visit your garden and see how beautiful it is and when it's all planted and that it's functioning. When people have finally built it, they often, when it rains, they'll run outside and see um, how the water is filling up and how it's soaking in and um, I just think that's exciting too and then you know you know you're part of the rain garden geeky family that we are so uh, um, okay so I'm gonna give you all a t-shirt when you finish your rain garden so looking forward to that oh so our joke of the day is actually a limerick from Karen Hart student master rain gardener student um, her current thoughts about her rain garden expressed as a limerick. Designing a rain garden's tricky. Slopes and obstructions are finicky. But the basin and plants will only enhance my yard in all its ubiquity. I, <laughs> Katie's laughing. <laughs> um, ubiquity, ubiquity was probably the hard word to come up with there. But <laughs> anyway, um, so with us today is Diana Lundquist. And she is the honorary clay representative um, of this class. Welcome, Diana. Hi, everyone. It's been very fun so far, so I'm anxious to show you what I've done. Um, I'll start by including that this site a year ago was a cornfield. So we moved into the house in February. The topsoil slash clay was spread in April and May and we quickly saw that we had a drainage problem. So Yeah, I can see the standing water there. Yeah. So we first we have several places around the yard where we put drainage pipes. And you can see here there you probably can't see it in the photo, but there is a drain pipe in there that's obviously not working. So then we thought, well, perfect place for a garden. And then after a July rain, you'll see here where my husband decided to outline everything that was wet. So that's a big area. It is a big area. And so you can see, I, I, you can't tell from the picture, but that all in front of the house 
um, that driveway area that all slopes that way which I guess is a good place for it to slope to could be towards the house and then we'd probably have a bigger problem that's right that's right so then we thought let's do that perk test <laughs> so that, that that is an 18 inch hole after a full three days of watching it I gave up <laughs> I didn't know it mattered anymore, honestly. And right. I wasn't sh and I wasn't sure what I was going to do with the garden because I had never experienced that much clay before. Yeah. So I was willing to play and listen to what you all think. So. Um, right. Early in my job, I used to worry about um, sites like yours where, you know, three days later it still has water in the in the hole. But um, actually, now I'm not worried. I've seen so many of them infiltrate really well after the compost is added and then after the plants are added. Um, I've seen so many, I'm not worried at all. So, Well, it is kind of interesting to watch the whole thing happen. So then we, so we measured the, um, the area that we had outlined and the larger area is like 15 by 38 and the smaller area within, which is the wettest area, is about 12 by 20. So that was the main place I wanted to do something first, um, and that was after the lawnmower got stuck right in that area, and we had to pull it out. Actually, there was no driving it out at that point. We had to yank it out of there. So. Oh, you had to like attach it to your truck, and yeah. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, so oh that was interesting. <laughs> but that's okay. We we have enough tree line that nobody could see us doing it. So it was. Okay. <laughs> Right, right. I really like how you had delineated this into like this is going to be the kind of the main rain garden, the wettest spot, and then you know this is going to be wet area, but not as you know not as wet. So then um, I actually after you know we were in class and heard wonderful ideas about plants for wet areas. I actually I went to the nursery, purchased some plants to get started with. So that's the plan for the wet area. Um, with varying heights, with the um, tall grasses at the far side, which I'll be able to see from the house, and then medium-sized plants, and then fill it in with some ground cover in the front. Yeah. So then, then <laughs> it rained. No. <laughs> <laughs> you changed your so, plans, yeah. So I decided that I probably should get some roots going in the larger area as well. Um, so I went and purchased a few more taller grasses to fill in and some more ground cover. Now none of that's been done yet. It's all sitting off to the sidelines getting watered until I'm actually ready to plant. But that was that was fun, picking up plants with your expertise. So oh, I yeah. That. Yeah, and you've already bought the plants. Okay, so there, now you have a deadline because you keep having to water them. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. Which is helpful. It really is helpful. You were mentioning that um, you were looking for some blue flag iris, and that in Kalamazoo you were having some trouble finding it. Um, the but the Wild Ones recommends that um, Hidden Savannah Nursery out there is a good source for uh, native plants. They're part of the Michigan Native Plant Producers Association, and they have some open days coming up in August 26th and then a couple in September. So. Um, if anyone's on the western side of the state, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, this is a good place to get native plants if you're looking for the straight, you know, grown from wild seed natives. And I, I gathered a couple, some photos together of your the plants that you had chosen, um, just so other people know what they look like. So you're talking about some really big grasses here. And hopefully the roots will go just as deep. <laughs> yeah. No, that's my plan. So. Yeah. Um, and then um, the Baptisia, which is a huge, another huge plant. And you have a huge space, so it makes sense to have big plants. And so tell me, do those, are these going to spread in the clay once I get? Well, um, you'll see. Um, Miscanthus, it has a reputation for spreading and is actually on a watch list for invasiveness. So I'd keep an eye on it. I mean, in this situation, you kind of want it to spread a little bit, but... Um, don't let it spread spread like you know too far afield. Let's say right, and I don't um, 
I don't know that we've ever used it in that wet of a situation. Yeah, we we haven't used it in the program. I do know that it comes from kind of wet um, heritage, so uh, it would be interesting to try and see what it does. Um, I guess what I would do is see how things go with that, and then have in your back pocket that you could use if you want you know, wetter uh, grasses, which I think is an excellent choice for your situation because you likely have deer too, I would imagine, if it was a cornfield. Um, and uh, that you might just keep in your back pocket um, that uh, some of the switchgrasses would totally work in that situation too and still have that big stature that you're looking for. Um, uh, something, you know, th that is a little bit taller would be the cloud nine, um, which gets to be, I don't know, eight feet-ish, something like that, depending on the conditions. Um, uh, so not as wide as what the, the miscanthus get like, um, you know, they just get massively wide. Like, I mean, they're huge. Um, so uh, the, the switchgrass won't get as wide as that. Um, so they, they just have a different form. They're kind of taller and more vase-shaped um, than the miscanthus um, are. Um, so, but I think it makes sense to use big plants out there <laughs> for sure because you got a big wide open area, you know, so why not, why not go for that? I've also never used the Baptisia in such a wet situation. I've read that it will definitely handle um, moist, or what it really wants is the sun. Um, but I've never seen it in a super wet situation before, so that's another one to like report back and let us know because this is kind of pushing three days of not draining. It's pushing the edge of um, what I've known, what I have experience with with that plant. It doesn't mean that it can't handle it, so we'd love to know if it does uh, handle the wetter stuff because that's what's great about these kind of extreme sites like this is that you can really help us define, you know, which of those plants truly can take those um, much wetter conditions uh, than others so that it's great for us because then that feedback loop of knowledge uh, feeds back into the class. So definitely stay in touch with us about how these guys uh, fare. Let's move into the next plants that you have there too. Um, the iris are going to be fine. They will like eat up the wet, no problem. They won't necessarily break up the soils in the same way because they're more frankly a wetland aquatic species um, so they don't tend to be super deep rooted but um, they'll be perfectly happy in that situation um, and the Joe pieweed can handle some wet too so that'll be interesting Susan and I were talking about the dwarf plumbago yesterday um, we just don't have experience with that one in rain gardens so uh, and we looked up a little bit of heritage on it and it doesn't come from like a wetland situation or even moist meadows but it does if we did a little bit of reading on it said it can handle some moistness that's different than standing water for a long period of time so if you've already bought 300 of them you know you've already bought 300 of them but what I would say it's a wonderful plant it's a really neat I like the color in the fall is so cool with that blue and their little seed capsules are just this awesome reddish tone they're really neat but if you look if you see that they look like they're suffering then I would move them sooner rather than later because we just don't that one is a little less um, we just don't have much experience. You have a big area, you know, so you don't want to throw a whole lot of money down the drain if they don't, um, if they look like they're they're suffering. They're also really like they're marginal in terms of our zone, and so I've always planted them in much more protected situations than you have. So if they're looking ragged, um, then that could also be an issue. And so one thing to consider before the winter, if you do decide to put them in this fall. Um, or, you know, soon in August is to give them a really nice heavy layer of leaf mulch cover uh, for the winter um, so that they have a chance to be able to um, be protected because I've always planted them more in sort of courtyard situations and things where I know they're getting a lot of protection from uh, trees or walls from the winds so um, and from cooler temperatures. So that's another thing to consider. I love, Diana, you. that you've already started digging. I know, that's awesome. This is awesome. Okay, Okay. so that was this week, earlier this week, after it rained, I think Monday, <laughs> and my husband said, I'm going to do something with that. So he came home, rototilled that area. Um, Great. So 
<laughs> it was very interesting. I wasn't home. I was sorry I missed it, but he. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not so easy with the wet soil like that to prototel. So <laughs> good for him. <laughs> yeah. So that was uh, the. Oh boy. No has been removed. And no, nothing's been added at this point. It's truly just tilled. He almost got sucked in with the I'm sure. <laughs> He needed waders on, you know? I mean, <laughs> that's <laughs> like sinking up to your thighs, kind of clay. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. It looked pretty for about a half a minute until it rained again on <laughs> Thursday, and now we have a pond again. So. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. And once you put in, for all these plants actually, especially the ones that are like marginally, we're not sure if they're going to be able to handle that much wet, the more compost you use, the better off they are. That that helps like give them something besides just dense clay to put their roots into. And also the, the compost actually like acts like a sponge and sucks up some of that water. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and how, how much, comp how, many, how many inches of compost should I really use? Um, I would say I would give it. Yeah, I mean, how far do you think he wrote it till down? Would you say? Oh, um, probably not far at all. Um, like six inches. I, I was. I originally or... told him like six inches of compost. That, uh, that'd be plenty. Yeah. That'd be plenty. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't that's go a lot. over fifty-fifty. Yeah, that's quite a bit. So um, even like four inches or three. I was going to say yeah. three. Yeah. 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 And just don't forget Susan's old calculator that she sent out. Um, because oh, that yeah. can help you figure out how many cubic yards you need. So, right, because the, the the computation from inches in square feet to cubic yards, yards. you know, it's nice to have a little calculator. Yeah. I mean, you can do it if you're, you know, you can do it if you're like, you know, good with the math, but um, it's nice to have a calculator. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. So here are some suggestions that we have, and some of these, um, not so much these on the page right now, but the next page is a little bit more like, try it and you'll see. Um, but we uh, we were thinking about, Shannon and I were getting together and thinking, like, brainstorming about what are some other plants you could use, which is um, just a Especially given us. the parameters that you, you, yeah. you had talked about, like certain colors and things like that. So we were trying to kind of work within the parameters th that you had talked about. That's true, because you were saying you really like blue flowers, right? I mm -hmm. do like blue, and I've never, I don't know anything about the blue vervain. I don't know anything about that. It's kind of tall and skinny. Um, okay. So, and when you see, it's funny when I was Googling, you know, trying to find photos of it, all of the photos are just of the flower head, which is gorgeous. But, but it's, the, it's the six plant feet of the <laughs> <laughs> It's like just a six foot tall plant. Um, but um, Shannon had the idea to mix it with or, you know, plant it near the white Joe Pie weed that you were talking about, and that's going to be really pretty. Okay. And then also, Rose Mallow really likes this like wet, wet soil. Yeah. Um, and maybe a white oh, one would look really nice with the white Joe pie weed. Mm -hmm. So there's one sort of set of ideas. Okay. And then we were talking about hydrangeas, and this is more like, why don't you just try it and see? Um, and if you don't want to, that's okay. But people out there, if you're interested in trying something um, in a rain garden, and that is hydrangeas. And it's interesting because people say that they like moist, well-drained soil, which, which is an oxymoron. Nice to have. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That is that? just like some horticulturalist dream, but yeah. really. <laughs> That's like sandy soils where it rains all the time. Like, right. what? Who has that? Where, where, so, where is that? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> I guess that's Oregon, actually, is where that is. Um, but it might be interesting to see, like, with a lot of compost amending the soil, how well these would do. Because they really like it moist, and they resent it when it gets dry. So I don't know. Like, see if you're yeah, interested in them. Yeah. And they're big. So they would be, you know, fun. And the hydrangea site. arborescence comes from more moist, I'd say, than the hydrangea paniculata, the PG one. So um, it's probably safer to go with the smooth hydrangea because that comes out of a native um, plant from the southeast and it grows along stream banks and, you know, things like that. So it's, a, I, I'm more familiar with that heritage of that plant in terms of where it comes from. Um, in, in the habitat that it comes from. So I think that, and that's another big plant that will spread. And so, uh, and it's kind of cool in the wintertime because those white um, kind of snowball-y flowers uh, dry in a really cool way and, and that can look kind of neat too. So some things to consider. Thank you. Yes. Um, and then we also, this was just sort of a, well, another ground cover if the um, 
plumbago doesn't work out, then um, and this might be too many grasses altogether, but um, if you end up doing more of the shrubs, then you could um, try palm sedge like it wet. So that'd be yeah. another thing that would sort of knit around all the other plants and create kind of a ground cover. Yeah, right. Well, I, I wonder, Susan. Room, so. Yeah, exactly. Um, I yeah. know. And and for that huge area, um, Susan, something that we did not talk about but is occurring to me now. Um, uh, Canada and enemy really, you know, um, oh, yeah. spread and take over, which is like kind of what you want in that big area. Um, you may consider that. I've also seen that fail in really, really wet situations too. So I, I'm not quite sure how wet is wet, you know, with yours. And so maybe you just buy a couple of those plants if you go to the wild type um, uh, field trip and just see how they do. And if they do well, you can divide them and divide them and <laughs> keep growing and growing and growing. So um, I think it's worth it because that big area that's wet, it's like it's it's a that's going to be a tough one, you know, to figure out how to um, who can help take over that zone for you um, because it's just such a big area. And um, I know you don't want to take it on right now in a big way, but um, if you can get something that'll start to spread quickly and handle that moist, then it's going to work. There was one, um, one of the um, attendees had a question about your plants, actually. Katie, what was that? Um, someone is wondering if all miscanthus cultivars are on the watch list for being invasive. That's a good question. Um, I think some more than others, for sure. All I know is that the Chicago Botanic Garden ripped out their entire miscanthus collection garden that they had. Ah. Uh. So, wow. yeah, they had quite an amazing garden, I remember, and they ripped the entire thing out. So that's all I, that's all I know. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Oh, boy. Okay. Well, sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Yeah. Um, let's see. And thank you so much, Diana. We really appreciate you coming on and um, telling us about your garden. Thank you. And it looks like you're well into your project. Yeah, so good you luck. go. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send follow up. Yes, right. please do. We want to yeah, see. Yeah, please let us know how things go, like even a year out or two years out. We'd love to know how some of your plants did um, in your extreme situation. So, thank you. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. All right. So next up is uh, a couple, Marilyn and Dave Wooten, and they are here together. Um, but you're not even actually um, uh, designing for your own garden, right? You're actually designing right. for your daughter and son-in-law. Right. So our daughter and son-in-law, uh, the home you're looking at is the home they purchased uh, June 1 of this year. When they were looking at the home to purchase back in March, uh, it was in a well-established neighborhood, off, if you're from Ann Arbor, off Sile Church, and a home actually butts up to I-94. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But um, we were looking at the home in March, and we noticed at that time that the backyard was really mucky. And we thought, well, perfect place to put in a wood garden. Great. Uh, we both volunteer at the Botanical Gardens, and so we're somewhat familiar with rain gardens and what they've done there. So uh, they're now in their home, and uh, they're busy doing the interior, and they said, Folks, you can do the exterior. It was a blank slate. We can do whatever we want to it. Um, and they were really looking forward to having a somewhat dry yard through the winter because they do plan on getting a dog and the dog would be running around um. there. So um, we took a look at the backyard and started the class and have identified an area in the backyard just. Uh, off of the existing uh, gutter drain pipe that you can see there in pretty much the middle of the slide. One of the things I will say is we think maybe this will take care of part of the problem, but the house does butt, butt up the fence. The backyard is fenced, and the fence butts up to a ravine uh, at the bottom of I-94, and there does seem to be a little bit of a drainage uh, area back there. There's a lot of vegetation, so you can't see the expressway, but it does seem to be pretty swampy there. So maybe in the future we'll have to think about putting some garden back along the back fence, but for now we're going to look at this. 
Now the garden will be located 15 feet off of that corner you just saw. We're going to be um, burying that drain pipe uh, down into the, the piece. The, the low spot that we're going to be looking at is adjoins a neighbor's fence. You recommend taking it two feet back from a, um, a uh, property line or a fence, but in discussions with a neighbor, uh, they also have uh, a drainage problem that if you look at it, the fence pretty much bifurcates it. It goes down the middle of the drain area. So when we did the determination of the roof size, um, and you can see this slide right here, um, up in the upper left-hand corner is the drain pipe, and it all drains down along that fence. I actually measured our uh, roof, which was 750 square feet, and their roof used on a laser uh, measuring because I didn't want to be crawling around on their, their roof. <laughs> and that and, uh, around 290 square feet would be mm. appropriate to handle both the drainage off of that mm. pipe and off of the full pipe of ours. And mm. we had discussions with them, and they said not an issue. So along those lines, we decided if you can barely see the rope that we use for the outline of the garden, I will not be putting a berm on so that anything that comes out of his pipe and flows in that way will also have an opportunity of flowing into the, the uh, rain garden. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it really yep. does. That's yeah. great. Aww. Now, my dog Maria, which is one of our two goldens, just had a wonderful time watching me dig this 18-inch hole. <laughs> <laughs> ball over, ball over and, and almost, uh, you know, says, I want to drop it in there, but it, it, it just didn't happen. Um, <laughs> but when we did our perk test, it was interesting. The first four inches was really good loamy soil. I mean, it was rich and it was very easy for the post hole digger to go down. The next 14 inches was clay, and I had to use a breaker bar to be able to get Wow. It do it. But it was interesting when we filled it the second time with water, the first four inches pretty much was gone within the first hour and it took about 12, uh, maybe 12 hours for the remainder to drain yeah. out. So yeah. It wasn't as bad as the previous one, but uh, um, we, I plan on digging down about uh, uh, about nine inches before I start mixing the clay back in with the loam. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, okay. Yeah, so you have medium soil, so you're like kind of in the middle of... Yeah. Uh, an infiltration test. And you can see this one. Okay, now this is the measurement of the backyard. As you can see, it's off to the left of the deck. We have a, a crab apple tree right behind the deck, and we have a absolutely gorgeous, about 40-year-old silver maple that's really healthy to the uh, far right. And so we wanted to keep it away. And as, Mar yep. as Marilyn mentioned, if you look back, that thin line across the back is this, the fence line, and there is pooling water there. And in earlier discussions with Susan, you know, we might just do some plantings back there sure, of, of sure. water tolerant mm -hmm. plants to be able to draw and break up the clay a little bit without maybe going with the full formal. But sure. if it needs to, we'll do that. Okay, next slide. That sounds like a plan. Yeah, yeah. totally. Do plant a bunch of shrubs back there or something like that that right. can take it. Yeah. There are a lot of shrubs on the city side of the fence, mm -hmm. uh, but not on the kids' side of the fence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's very shady there, so we'll have to put in a whole different type of right. uh, plant right. than the ones we're going to go over now. Yep. So this is our drawing. Uh, most of these plants I plan to transplant from my existing garden because I kind of overplanted in the three years we've been here at this house. So uh, the larger plants listed there are the fall sinigo, one on each end. Uh, and then next to those uh, in the back against the fence, I would put two feathery grass. Mm -hmm. Surrounding those would be purple cone flowers, and then in kind of in front of those three plants, a blue flag iris, uh, and some in front of those would be blue lobelia, one patch of black-eyed Susan there where the number six is, and then a nice, lo the lowest um, sh plants I could think of at the time, so I'm looking for suggestions, would it be either wild geranium or fox edge, just mm -hmm. kind of along the front. Mm -hmm. Just so people who ha don't know the plants, um, I put together some photos that are those plants, but as they bloom, like, so this is what it would look like in spring, sort of, um, with the iris and the wild geranium and the fox edge. Right. And then yeah, in so summertime, do, do, did you have a... No, I think it's great to see it this way. I can't wait to, it's all in <laughs> And look how pretty summer's going to be with um, uh, purple coneflower, black-eyed Susan's, Baptisia. 
very pretty. And mm -hmm. then um, fall, because you have that um, blue lobelia in there and the feather reed grasses, you know, of course, right. going spectacular. Right, right, right. You have something going on in fall. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then in the wintertime, since you mentioned to me that you were going to put some... Um, yeah. uh, right. so we dogs. have some uh, red twig dogwoods that are just huge, too big for our property. So we, we hope to transplant those and put them on either end along the fence. Right. Just because there's, I think, more than enough water to support those. Yeah. I do like yeah. the way that looks in the winter with the... Yeah, that'll be really pretty. Yeah, you might consider with the red twig dogwood also um, for that back fence area. Those do really well as just a you can cut the branches during the dormant season and just you know chunk them in the ground and they oh, can start grow. rooting. Yeah, okay. so uh, it's a really cheap way <laughs> to be able to you yeah. know get that back fence area going. Um, you want to do it during the dormant season though, so you could do it like in November, you know, something like that, um, when you can still get it, still get it in the ground. Um, so if you've got some huge ones, then that's a perfect opportunity to be able to trim it up a little bit, and, you know, get some of those into and and overplant it because not all of them will make it. Um, well, but, they do well in shade. Do they do okay in shade? They will. They're not as full, but they will grow in shade. So, okay. um, Shannon, on that, uh, I do a lot of the grooming in the greenhouses for Mike uh, Palmer at the Botanical Gardens. Great. Right. Yeah. When we cut them back to when we groom them down, and we want good growth, we cut them back to the first node up from the uh, from the stalk. Mm -hmm. Is a similar spot where I would cut them or groom them down so yep. that they uh, uh, maximize the opportunity of them. Yep. Of that's perfect. Yep. Because that, that spot is kind of a power place, you know, because that's where it's sprouting out. So yes, that's, that, that's exactly what you should do. So, okay. Okay. Yep. And then it's just a, a, a question, because we would be transplanting these, should we cut them back? Mike always suggests cutting them low, yes. cut the branches before you transplant, so cut them back. Yeah, and you might even consider doing that one um, uh, a little bit later in the season when things are starting to go a little bit dormant, but you can still get into the soil. Um, November? Yeah, I, I mean, if it's possible. I know sometimes you just want to get everything done all at once. Um, but yeah. there's just a lot less loading on the plant in terms of being able to, so part of what you're doing when you're cutting it back is you're, you're you know, you're allowing the plant to not have to support so many leaves yeah. um, because it, it's a lot of energy, you know, to be able to pump those all full of water and, and it's transplanted, doesn't have its roots, you know, really connected to the soil. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. So if you can do it during the dormant season before everything freezes up, so October, November, that would be the best. But um, yeah, I think cutting it back would be a really good idea. You could take it all down and then you could take all your extras and just you know, stagger them against that back fence and see what happens. That, that's what I would try, you know. So it's great that you have some things there, some big, um, you know, healthy shrubs there to be able to, it, it might be challenging to dig them up too. You may find that it's like, whoa, this is a lot of plant yeah. to try to dig out. And if that's the case, then you can just take those same things and try doing this and see if you can get them to root in the same way, you know, well, if, if it just be. That's why they invented pickaxes and shovels. That, yeah, I know, but <laughs> it's it's rough work too. So yeah. I also just think it's awesome you're doing this for your kids. It's really a, it's a very nice yeah. gift. It's really just a it's a great right. thing you're doing for them. So great. But I think your planting plan looks great. I Susan, yeah. could you go back? I love how oh, you go back. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. you go back. Keep uh -huh. going. Sure. Keep going. Keep going before all your fun stuff you added. Oh, in. Okay, yeah. I just think I love the way that you did your plan where you kind of outlined the zones in a color and shaded it in, but then you put the individual plants in too so you know what your numbers are. I think that's a really uh, legible way to make your plan. I think that's a great, great way to handle that. Well, I haven't seen today. people do Yeah, kudos to you for that. I think that's <laughs> a really great way to handle that. Um, and I think all yeah, your plants so you look like count. Fun. You can count how many plants it's going to take and then buy that many. It's perfect. Right. Yeah, right. I do need to buy quite a few. Uh, I do have some, but I will need to buy a lot of the li young little ones. Mm -hmm. So speaking of that, so we think your plan is great, but we just felt uh, like we should make some other suggestions, more okay. for other people. You know, if they have a similar soil, similar sun situation, then they could do this. Or if you want to, you know, do sure. something different, it's fine. Um, 
uh, something you were saying that you like purple and pink colors, yeah. and um, the rose mallow has these massive, massive. I actually flowers. have five of those in my backyard that need oh. to be retransplanted. Yeah. Ah. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Three plants. Yeah. Yeah, and in those places, you know, you have a, a decent amount of space in between your Carl Forster feather reed grass. Yeah. And and the shrubs, like you could probably tuck a few of those in there too. I bet you know okay. uh, you could. I bet you could have a little bit of room in there because the, they're they're so much taller. They'll kind of occupy a different niche in some ways than the than the lower iris stuff that you have there. Yeah, so. and the purple coneflower. Yeah, mm -hmm. is what I want back in there. So yeah, maybe I could tuck one or two in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then but, we also had some suggestions for some more um, sort of. Uh, um, ephemeral or filigreed things like um, mountain mint which is this it looks like baby's breath and it would look kind of cool with those big flowers um, I found this photo um, on the internet this is how big a rose mallow flower is it's massive um, so it's kind of fun um, but something that's much more delicate together with that those huge flowers would be really pretty like obedient plant which is spreads like crazy um, but maybe that's good because it'll be low maintenance for your um, daughter and son-in-law since maybe yeah, which is their hobby. Is important. Yeah, um, and mountain mint is another suggestion. But you know, feel free to do what you want because yeah. you know a lot right. about plants. Oh, well, thank you. You can experiment. Sure. Um, yeah, so thank you, thank you so much, Marilyn and Dave. This is great to see your yard and what you're planning. I hope you inspire lots of other people. And good luck. This looks like a really nice gift yeah, to give. It really does. Thank you. Thanks for your help. All right, great, thanks. All right, so next up, um, are there any questions that people have had that we should address now, Katie? Yeah, so um, somebody asked if any of these rain gardens need some kind of sediment trap. So a lot of the public gardens will have some sort of area where when the water flows in, all the sediment can settle down mm -hmm. and then it will fill in with dirt. Um, do any of these smaller rain gardens need that? I think it really depends on what the impervious surface is from which you're drawing. So if it's your roof, you don't need to worry about that. If it's a big driveway area, and especially one that gets a lot of use, um, then there could be some sediment stuff that's coming off of it. It's really roads and parking lots where you get the most, where you're getting a lot of traffic coming in and out of there. So that's where you really have to worry about it. Your own driveway, I don't know, kind of depends on how how many people are going in and out of it. And if that's the case, then you could just put a little stone zone like the, um, the with the first one we were looking at, you know, she could just put a little stone area that's six inches wide right next to that driveway where it's pitching towards it and be able to capture sediment in there. The thing that is a pain about it is that over time, if there is enough sediment, it will kind of fill up and you'd need to pull those stones out and then like scoop out the sediment. It's kind of a pain. It really, um, so, if you don't, if you don't think you're going to have a sediment problem, then I'd say skip it. But if you're in a parking lot or capturing road water, then it is something you need to talk about. And it's not not something we focus on in this class because the scale of what people are doing usually is much smaller, and the water source is usually cleaner. So I don't know, Susan, you have any thoughts? Um, I do, but I think that's actually a perfect segue to our next um, ah. site <laughs> because she is actually getting water from her driveway and mm -hmm. um, it we have a photo of the sediment coming off her driveway so it ah, can kind of be how much yeah it yeah is. yeah that's great hi Anna how are you hey <laughs> good thank Welcome. you thanks um, so yeah I do I live on a dirt road and um, when it rains um, so every time we drive obviously some of that dirt roads getting on the driveway right. and then um, so uh, we do have sediment coming down that driveway which in the best design ever all that water runs right into our garage <laughs> so Excellent. Um, I'm Perfect. sure what was going on there <sighs> so um, at some point the previous homeowner had put in this drain which you can just kind of see behind that that clump there um, so yeah there's you can see the drain um, mm. so that does kind of go out so um, does the sediment yeah, collect in the, the drain is the sediment collecting the drain too? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, it's deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my kids actually, I tasked them with digging it out. So uh, with their tiny Excellent. little plastic shovels. So, there you uh, go. <laughs> Put in work. It's an activity. It's a fun activity for them. 
Um, so uh, yeah, but you can see the sediment there, and then it it will go. It does actually when it's really heavy rain, it actually goes out onto the grass, and you can see where it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah. And that's what it looks like when it rains. So um, the drain tries to capture some of it, and when that's full, then it just kind of starts flooding. And eventually, yeah. it will start trying to back up into the garage. So uh, I'm excited mm. to be um, able to put a rain garden here and uh, add some color and uh, some habitat, and um, also try and deal with some of this extra water that we're getting. So yeah, 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 yeah. I love it when there's like a problem that the rain garden's solving. It's yeah, awesome. right, right. So this is kind of like a schematic of. Um, uh, of what we have right now, so uh, um, you can see the drain and uh, the back of the driveway. So uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my percolation test was uh, somewhere between three and ten hours. So um, okay. I actually got tired and went to bed, and then when I got up, it had drained out. So um, because I've got kind of a lot, <laughs> large, um, like there's a lot of area that that rain's hitting. Um, the gun's gonna be kind of big. So, um, but I think that it's gonna look fine. The, they, um, we're on like about an acre, so as far as it being proportioned to the rest of the yard, I think it will look good. So, mm -hmm. size for it. yeah. So um, when I came to planning, I kind of measured out like a rectangle of how much space I think it needs to take up, mm -hmm. and then I started trying to make that look a bit more aesthetically pleasing. So, uh, sure. I kind of tried a couple of different. Um, shapes, um, but one of the things I needed to bear in mind is. Um, guests coming or like even for us like this is one of the main ways we access the backyard so when I looked uh -huh. at my plans I needed to have a way for people to get through it so uh -huh. um, uh -huh. some of the area can be taken up by a path or like stepping stones or sure. whatever so I think that will help so uh -huh. Uh -huh. the first plan I came up with um, and then um, I also had another one with a longer path um, uh, but in the end, I decided to go with something that's more similar to the first design, but with a longer path. So it will take up more of the rain garden. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, a little bit of low maintenance. So, um, and then uh, um, I was asked, like, well, what's it going to look like from the side? So I um, went out and took a photo and um, tried to do my best of drawing on what that, like, first shape will look mm -hmm, like. Mm -hmm. um, when this is looking from our deck down towards the driveway. You can just oh, see the great. corner there. And then you can see my compost bin and <laughs> the yeah, little yeah. shed there as well. So, but I'm hoping this will actually, um, you know, really brighten up this area a little bit. And sure. you can see some of those pines are getting a little bit, you know, not so beautiful anymore. So uh, I think it'll be nice, like, um, to have something there. Yeah, and that's totally. the shape that it'll look like from the side. Yeah, so those this is my are good, good backdrop. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just like close up, they're not so great anymore. So, but um, this is my plan. So I tried to stick with. Um, yellow and blue and some white flowers um, and because it is kind of big um, I already have this big um, red twig dogwood that's not really thriving where it is so I'm gonna move that and I think it'll actually be much happier in the rain garden mm -hmm. and that will take up a big bit of space so I'm kind of excited about that and then um, where the path is I wanted the summer sweets there so that when you walk through in the summer it will smell really nice yeah that's a um, great idea and then um, thinking about what Shannon um, said in the class about planning for the winter first so then I'll have that dogwood and then the yeah. fox said I'll have like a little like shape as well mm -hmm. and then the rest of the stuff so yeah trying to do um, like I said blue and yellow and then um, also like different heights so you can see them from different areas mm -hmm. but and then mm -hmm. hopefully have some interest like through the spring and summer as well so uh, yeah. and then I'm planning to plant the like something short like the wild strawberry that's going to spread um, so that that can take up some of the space too because I've got two little kids I work full time so I'm not going to be able to be out there all the time working right. on it so right. it's going to be a bit sporadic <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. hoping some of those spreading ones will help me out a little bit there so yep yeah yep and then here are some photos yeah so this is my plan so <laughs> um, I wanted to see how it was going to look like through through the seasons and everything yep. so yeah and I think some of those like the when you were saying about the blue um, verein like sticking out, I think that's going to look kind of cool. So I'm excited for the mm -hmm. to get planting yeah. on it, get digging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We liked. Oh. Um, so you were like saying you liked yellow and blue, and your husband was said no pink flowers. Was it? No <laughs> <laughs> so um, our yard's very green. Um, so we don't really have a whole lot. There's a little part of like wildflower type things, like you know. Um, but really it's very very green we have a lot of black raspberries all around the edge mm -hmm. um, 
but yeah, so I'm like seeing this as a kind of a hopefully a like nice pop of color, um, but yeah, no pink. No pink. <laughs> no pink. That's good. Good to know. We we really liked your plan, and we thought it it looked beautiful. And um, if you planned it just the way you planned it, it would be lovely. But we feel like we now we're you know what are we doing here? We have to suggest something. So. Oh, um, <laughs> Um, the, and plus, your one of your objectives was to, for it to be really low maintenance, and I think the wild strawberry is a good pick for that because it yeah. will take over other um, areas and just crowd out the weeds, which is really nice. Especially um, another, on the edges, on the edges, you know, because yeah. it doesn't necessarily like the wet, wet. But um, okay. that would be a great one for the for the edges, and then it'll just kind of govern itself in terms of the hydrology. It'll go down as far as it can, and then it'll stop when it gets okay. too wet for it. So. When so it, I think that part will be the bit that's going to be hit the most with the sediment and in the winter possibly salt. Is it going to do okay with that? No. <laughs> <laughs> the salt, it's so, it will not like the salt. Okay, so, we don't salt our driveway, but I feel like some of it comes from the tires, you know. So even, right, but if you don't salt your driveway and it's only what you're dragging in and you've got a dirt road, which is very unlikely that it that salted because usually those are like the lowest priority. Or, you know, um, I, I'm, as I'm sure, as I'm sure you are, you're, you're aware, um, then you don't have to worry about it. It's not okay. that sensitive. But in okay. parking lots where we have tried it, you know, then uh, where people salt, it just totally disappears. So, okay. but if it's just whatever you're dragging in, then I wouldn't worry about it too much. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. And we had a couple of other ideas for things that spread that you might put, like in between the stepping stones, because mm -hmm. I know in, in my garden, between my stepping stones, I didn't plant anything, and then things plant themselves, and then it turns into sort of a maintenance headache. So by planting something, you kind of like co-opt that. Um, one idea is Canada anemone, which is another spreader, uh, which you, you know, we've heard us talk about. But then also swamp buttercup has yellow flowers, which is in mm -hmm. your you know, planting scheme and it'll spread like that and since you have um, it's kind of medium soil sandy gravel then uh, it'll be happy and it looks great in the spring it has all these beautiful uh, yellow flowers that stick yeah, out it's still low it's nice yeah, yeah. it'll be really pretty with your iris and your other yellows are later in the season yeah um, so that would be pretty to be able to have that going great Oh, and you know, there was one other thing that Shannon and I were thinking about, and it's sort of an opportunity because you have little kids, and you know, this is my kid playing in the gutter, but you won't have your kid won't need to play in the gutter because they're going to have this rain garden to play in. And in Shannon's um, garden, you were saying that you had like a spot that was sort of you didn't plant anything there because you knew that it was going to get kind of roughed up by the right, kids. Right, right. Yeah, so let me just describe a little bit of what I have, which may inspire you for how you think about the, the inlet from, uh -huh. your, um, from your trench drain, right? Because the water's flowing to your trench drain, then I would imagine it's going in through the trench drain and out the side, right? And that you're capturing some of that water from the trench drain in your garden, correct? Yeah. So you're getting whatever comes off the driveway as well as what's coming in the trench drain. But the trench drain is kind of point flow, right? It's like a spot where the water is coming out. Um, so instead of it just opening up into the wide garden, what you might consider is having that be a little bit of a swale for a while, like a little kind of ditch where the water is coming out. It's like it has a little neck on it. And then, so what my kids have done, I, like I got so many summers of play out of this, <laughs> which Tell is me great. All. <laughs> um, you're weeding, you know, they can be doing something, um, which is they stick the hose in the pipe, all right, and then the water comes out. That's all very exciting, right, to watch it come out the other side. But then they become like these little engineers, and you have some rocks and things like that, and then they like block the water, and they see what happens, and they make little dams and little weirs. And it's a whole lot easier to do that if you have a narrow neck coming off of that water source than if it's just opening up into the wide garden, because then you have to build a much bigger weir <laughs> to be able to kind of contain the water. And so if you just have like some river rock kind of stuff, things like egg rock that's like, you know, two to four inches, something like that, that's really easy to be able to find at a hardware store um, or at Lowe's or something like that. They will have hours of fun, you know, watching the water come out and figuring out how it behaves as it enters the garden. And uh, I just got like so much mileage out of that, I can't even tell you. It was like summers, 
it was multiple summers in a row. Um, and so I can, your kids I can are see young enough. loving it. Yeah. Totally, totally, exactly. So uh, that would be um, just a fun way to modify it a little bit um, so that then you can get, um, it's just easier for them to be able to have conduct their engineering experiments in that narrower channel than it is as if it just kind of spills into the big wide garden all at once. Yeah, so how, um, so, like you narrow in the pipe or? So in other words, like instead of having your rain garden end at the edge of your driveway, mm -hmm. the place where the pipe comes in, so does the pipe just kind of cut off and comes out from the side of your driveway? Yeah, pretty much. So what, and so instead of the rain garden, the border of the rain garden going all along the flat side of your driveway, when the, coming to the pipe stuff, imagine that oh, you're, yeah, that it's like curving around and and you are, just imagine if there's, like, if you're extending the pipe, think about it that way. And so you just have like a, a foot or two or maybe even three feet or something of extending it. It's just that it's an open pipe instead of it's a it ditch. being buried. It's a ditch. Oh, cool. So oh, it's yeah. just That's narrow, different. you know, and then they can, um, and then you just have a pile of rocks around and, and then, and then you, you know, then the Legos go in and all that fun, <laughs> all that fun I'm stuff. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, that sounds so, great. Yeah, it's really fun. It's just a really fun way for kids to be able to interact and experiment with your water, and um, and that's part of like how they learn about the world and part of how they learn about what you're doing too. You know, in terms mm -hmm. of the sustainability piece, also is they just yeah. I don't know. It, it's just it, it was a lot of fun for them. So that's something to consider as well. That sounds great. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming um, for coming and telling us about your your plan, and I can't wait to see this. This is going to be great. Oh. <laughs> thanks so much for this class. It's been sure. really interesting. Awesome. Great. Good. Good. All right. Thanks a lot. And next, our last um, person, and this is um, Emily's yard is sand. Sand. So some people, you would think this is like the easiest thing in the world to garden, but actually it's reasonably difficult, Emily. And you were saying that your goal is to soak in that water and you hate seeing it run off your yard when you're on sand. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, you like to hear what the problems are that we're hoping to solve. Well, I got a long list of problems. Um, <laughs> Great. <laughs> the, downspout, the arrow is pointing to the downspout at the corner of the house. And okay. obviously, when the when it rains, the water coming out of the downspout washes away the mulch into a little mini gully. Uh, but my front lawn here is very droughty. Um, it faces south, so it gets a lot of sun. It's on very sandy soil. Uh, the turf, I mean, we hear, I've read that turf has very poor infiltration, and I was surprised that on sandy soil, how poor the infiltration is on the front lawn. Um, if I don't put, put on the sprinkler every single day, for, uh, it gets very droughty. I put it on for five minutes, ten minutes, any more than that, and the water is running off the sandy soil into the street. Wow. Uh, so there's a bit of infiltration through the turf into the soil below. Uh, and I have this very droughty front lawn that is dependent on daily sprinklers, which, of course, everybody will say, oh. put your sprinklers on just a couple times a week and just put it on for 10, 20 minutes. Well, that doesn't work on this lawn because it's hmm. so, uh, has so little infiltration. Hmm. Um, How annoying. Yeah, really. <laughs> like you have to stand. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then, of course, it's also the front lawn. Uh, so I need it to be neat, um, and I've got a landscape that was installed by the previous owner, which is kind of conventional and boring, boring views in the background and such. Uh, but I do have two nice river birch trees there that. Uh, yeah, they look really pretty. Shape, but, yeah. Uh, uh -huh, yeah. Good. Those two trees uh, are really pretty. So um, I did a perk test. It uh, is very sandy soil. It perked in less than an hour. That's uh, great. The roof area is 600, over 600 square feet. It's just half of my garage for this uh, downspout. And so calculating 20% of that would be 122 square feet. Um, so I'm looking at putting it in the front lawn, more or less where, well, behind where this tarp is, between the mm -hmm. row of stones and the tarp. Uh, but that would be about half the area. You can see on the next slide where I've outlined the rain garden inside that hose. Mm -hmm. It's about half of the area, so 10% of uh, the roof area instead of the recommended 20%, about five feet wide and about 16 feet long. 
I'm thinking that would be okay because it is such totally. standard corner once I totally. took off. Uh, and the rain, there's no basement here. This is the garage. So it starts 10 feet from the house. It slopes away from the house. There's another 44 feet before you get to the street in front of the house. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I mean, tell me what your thoughts are, but I think that having an undersized rain garden here would be okay. Totally. Yeah, with um, that, that kind of perk rate, you're golden. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with with the first person with clay, you would never want to do that. But with this, yeah. easy. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. All right. Uh, so this is my planting plan, uh, and I put in a corn a picture of where it actually is on the lower right corner. Uh, I'm thinking of some irises, the blue flag irises, and then the combination of uh, a bed of black-eyed susans and geraniums. You can see I've already got some black-eyed susans on the left, uh, and even behind where the rain garden would be, so they look better in full sun. They might be okay here. They do pop in front of the trees. Um, and then the native geraniums are nice and neat. And then I would put in a row of uh, wild, ger wild ginger in the front because that looks neat as well. Um, I don't know. It's not a lot of, not a big variety of plants, but it's not a really big rain garden either. Sure, right, right. You need to keep it simple. Keeping it simple is often really good. It, yep. And especially for a front yard, having a um, limited number of plants is, is good, actually. Yeah. I put these photos together for you just so we can sort of see like what it would look like and then I realized this is pure fantasy because these things don't bloom at the same time just <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also that if it's sunny enough for the black-eyed Susan it's probably way too sunny for the wild ginger that I mean it looks like it would, it would make such a pretty border but it's gonna be too much light just we can see what from the um, from this photo we're like oh yeah. it's just gonna like cr it's gonna um, crisp up right when it gets that much sun. It's that yeah. picky. Like it's, yeah, uh, it really is. Yeah, it really likes full shade. But we had some suggestions um, for just to jazz it up a little bit and make those wild geraniums look even better is to maybe mix in some woodland flocks and they bloom at the same time and they'll give you sort of like mo multiple hues of that lavender and they're both tiny plants so they'll look really sort of nice and neat and low for the front the, of your house. The woodland flocks will disappear over the summer. It's one of those woodland ephemerals that looks gorgeous in May and then it just kind of goes dormant after that. So it needs a companion like the wild geranium who does keep its leaves all summer and which is also very short and neat looking. So that's another option even is to spread that along your front berm because that would totally take those varying light conditions along there. The woodland flocks you would only want in the bottom of your ring garden because it really does like moist and if your soils are as dry as you're saying I wouldn't put them on the berm. Um, but it's really beautiful. It's much more, it's kind of more blue toned than the wild geranium and together they're just a gorgeous combo actually. So it'd be really pretty in the spring. So you're thinking of putting in a drift of each or mixing them up? You'd mix them up every other. Yep. And I would still plant the geranium kind of close to, you know, 18 inches on center or something like that. So from center plant to center of plant. But then you could put a wild flocks in between. And it doesn't have to be like 50% of one and 50% of the other. But to have some woodland flocks coming up through it is it would be super pretty at the same time. So that's another a possibility, but only in the more moist parts, I think, given what your soils are, are doing. Good. Another um, suggestion, and this is sort of a totally different combination, is um, to think about hostas, and hostas will do well, gosh, in even deep, deep shade, um, and they uh, will take rain garden conditions. So those big, they're not a native, so like those big leaves can make natives which are sometimes a little wispier look good so having a hosta combined with some some pure natives like um, red baneberry which has the red uh, berries or doll's eyes which has the white berries which actually actually look like doll's eyeballs it's interesting a little creepy it's, it's, yeah. it's a little creepy <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're cool a, yeah they're really neat cool cool plant and a beautiful plant and it's sort of small and feathery and then also early meadow rue which we've talked about before which is feathery as well and those very delicate textures together with the hosta can look really good and then Shannon also had an idea um, you know back to one of her favorite plants which is the Aurelia which actually is reasonably small 
having if you have that is sort of a chartreuse color and if you get the hostas also in a chartreuse mm -hmm. color that might be kind of cool yeah and they'd really pop against your use you know from the back you said um right against that dark background mm -hmm. yep mm -hmm. and then a whole totally different idea that we had um and emily you know, we were talking right before we started shannon and emily said that she was just thinking about this too is oh no way an edge of uh, the fall blooming anemone japanese yeah. anemone, which would be very pretty and especially you have that salmon co colored house i think it would look really good in front of your house yeah and and nothing in your plan addressed fall so this would be a nice thing to be able to um, extend the season into the fall too um, and I, I just think this plant is really cool. I, it's not native at all, and I don't think it would take. See, this is not a typical rain garden plant, but because your soils are so dry, you have more options than the rest of us do. So um, it could be on the berm too, or I think it could probably even take the bottom just because you're so well drained. And you have this really weird thing going on with your soils, you know, that it's so sandy, but at the same time it runs off. And my guess is that it has to do with something with construction practices that happened a while ago. And so given the fact that you're digging this whole thing out, you're adding compost, stuff like that, and then you're adding plants that are going to have deep rooted, um, you know, form, then you're, you're going to be fine, I think, uh, with this. Unless there's some weird hard pan of clay that you find, you know, uh, um, but I think you're going to be, I think it's likely how they built the place that is messing you up rather than um, in terms of the sand and the runoff and the lack of deep roots from the um, existing lawn. I'm guessing when I take off the turf and mix up some compost, it's just going to soak right up. Yeah, I think it will too. The other thing you might consider doing is um, overseeding with some fescues. Um, which are more drought tolerant and so it kind of depends I couldn't tell from your photo whether that was like hundred percent bluegrass but that's a terrible you know it, it, it that really does not do well in terms of uh, droughty conditions and some of the fescues are more droughty uh, they, they just will go a little bit deeper with their roots and so it may be worth it to try to do some overseeding uh, with that I'm not a huge lawn person I don't know a ton about lawn but you could go into a lawn place and ask them and they'd probably have some suggestions for you around those uh, particular varieties that would work well with that okay. that's a really good suggestion because how annoying that you have sandy soils and the water runs off your lawn I know. that's just like <laughs> thank goodness you're putting in a rain garden I know really exactly exactly that's doing good in the world <laughs> that's right good job Emily yeah you're that's doing right a good thing in the world. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for um, presenting your plan during our class. It takes a lot of bravery, and I appreciate yeah. that. Um, thanks for coming on. Well, okay, so everyone, what do you do now? What is your assignment? Well, dig, and a lot of people have already started, so that's great. And, um, and it's nice that it just rained a little bit so that the soils are a little bit softer, which makes it a lot easier. So start digging. Get your compost delivered or go get some bags and till in the compost. M spread your mulch and then get plants. So, um, oh, and then plant them. And I just wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about what your deadlines are. If you have sand or loam, you know, those mid medium soils or droughty soils, you can plant all the way. I've planted stuff into November. Um, that's your deadline. If you have clay soils, probably the beginning of October is when you want to have everything planted. If you don't, you can always divert the water away from your rain garden temporarily just for the winter and then put it back in the spring and that's okay too. So you have some options, but um, just so you know what your deadlines are. And if you're behind, don't worry, like it's totally okay. Our deadlines are artificial. Nature's deadlines are real because it's gonna be winter. You can't dig a rain garden in winter or only one person has ever done that and you know, but they had a sunny winter. Um, and, but next year you have another chance. So keep that in mind. You can always plan ahead for something that's coming up in the spring as well, that's fine. Also, where are you going to get these plants? There's lots of opportunities to get plants coming up, both on this side of the state and the western side of the state. Uh, here on the eastern side, we're going to have a plant swap this weekend at Pioneer High School, the Reckon Ed offices. And um, I'll, people will bring plants, people will take plants, you never know what's going to show up, so get, keep an open mind. And then also we'll have another plant swap in the fall um, at uh, 
Michael of um, Ziedler's house and he always um, hosts a barbecue and we'll have a potluck and you know you'll get to know each other which is super fun plus people will bring plants and seeds and things that you can put in your garden. We will also have a field trip to wild type as you know and we'll get a personal tour of this native plant nursery. The, the native plant nursery from Ann Arbor will be at the farmers market all the way through August in Ann Arbor. Also, and even Shannon didn't know about this until I mentioned it to her, Mathai Botanical Gardens is having a native plant sale this fall. And the native plant nursery will be there, but also the Mathai Botanical Gardens has been growing native plants in their greenhouses, and they'll be selling them. It's a great way to get some reasonably priced native, which is fantastic. Hidden Savannah Nursery over on the western side of the state has a few more open days uh, this fall. Go visit them and then I'll be able to once you have planted your rain garden send me a note because I want to give you your t-shirt your sign if you want one a certificate and then also if you have a master gardener um, name tag I'll give you a little raindrop to stick it on it so that other master gardeners will say oh how did you get that raindrop and you can tell them all about being a master rain gardener so I'm looking ahead to that. And then also, you know, feel free at that point, you are authorized to spread the word about rain gardens. Give a talk, host a garden tour, tell, give a little talk to your um, local elementary school, and then also help the master rain gardeners in the next class, because lots of people, I think, gave comments on your plans and gave you good ideas, pay it forward. So I'll send you an email with reminders about all the different plant uh, acquisition opportunities and field trips. Good luck and have fun with all of your digging this week. It should be great. It's The weather's tr turning so that it's a good time to dig. Um, and it's been a pleasure to have you all in class. And keep me updated about your rain garden work. I want to see photos. And I'd love to come visit your garden, especially if you're in Washtenaw County. I'll be able to come and visit you and ooh and ah over your rain garden. Um, or I, I can mail it to you if you're a little bit farther afield. So we'll stick around and answer questions now. If you need to go back to work, now's a good time. But um, Katie, what are some questions that have come up? All right, the first question is, what if my yard is in deep, deep shade? Is there a good example that I could look at of other plants, another garden that somebody has planted? Or how can I get ideas on that? So there are lots of options for deep shade. So don't be, don't fear. <laughs> um, I would say that, th first of all, you get to use wild ginger, whereas other people <laughs> don't. So there you go. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then the, um, some other options for the deeper shade um, would be the early meadow rue um, is another good option for that. The, I think the aurelia still works in the deep shade. Didn't we find that, Susan? Mine's on the north side of the house, so yeah, yeah. I think it would do fine. Um, Aurelia is, um, spike nard is the common name. Right, right. Um, the sedges do fine in the deep shade as well. Um, and uh, geranium will flower more in, the, uh, in a little bit of sun, but it'll handle the deeper shade too. Um, Susan, do you have any ideas? I hate to say this because it's so um, overused, but hostas will take, you know, the deep shade under Norway maples even. Right. Um, you can always, and they can make some of the more ephemeral things that grow on, in deep shade, like our ephemeral wildflowers. Hostas can kind of make them look good. So that's good. Oh, and you and I were talking about Jack in the Pulpit. Jack yeah, the Pulpit. that would be an interesting one because that will grow in just like absolute deep, 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 deep shade. So uh, that's definitely another option. Um, and then if you're willing to just kind of ignore the fact that things don't necessarily flower in the same way, um, you know, some of the other shrubs and things like that, um, like the summer sweet will grow in deeper shade. It just doesn't flower as much, you know. So if you're willing to kind of give up on some of that, you can still have some, um, use some things. Like the iris will grow in deeper shade too. Not in like super dark. It kind of depends on what your deep shade is caused by, I think, in some ways, because if it's caused by building structures, that's never changes. But if they're caused by, um, you know, trees around them, you know, you get a little bit of light in there in the spring and you might be able to get uh, some of your woodland ephemerals going. So I would, and then ferns, totally ferns. ferns. Go for ferns, big time. 
Yeah, it also, I would say it depends on how fast your um, infiltration rate was because you may have some ferns open to you, you know, that you could get away with more easily. So, yeah, and there's so many different textures and colors of ferns mm -hmm. that you could really mm -hmm. have some fun just painting with ferns. Yep, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, any, what else has come up, Katie? All right, someone wants to know if they live on the west side of the state, how can they be certified? Just through pictures? Yes, actually, <laughs> through photos. <laughs> but also, um, I'm partnering with a few organizations over there. Uh, Jamie McCarthy with the Kalama Kalamazoo River Watershed Council um, will come and see your um, your garden in person, as will um, uh, um, with, uh, Trout Unlimited with Nicole DeMall is out there, and she will also come out and look at your garden in person. So I have a few you know, connections in other parts of the state where uh, people will come out and look at your garden. And also, like, it's nice to be connected with those local organizations because they're doing amazing work. And so you can start hearing about what they're doing and you guys can um, start helping each other. So that's, it's always nice for good people to know each other. Okay, and is it possible to get your certification by helping somebody else or by adopting a rain garden? Yeah, I encourage people to work together because it's a big job. Building a rain garden is a big job. And so if you, maybe together with a friend, you build a rain garden on their uh, property and you work together, that's fine. You both get certified as a master rain gardener because you both did it. And um, you, really the important part is you've built it yourself so you can answer questions about um, that people have about how to build a rain garden. And you'll know because you'll have done it yourself. So as long as you can do that, then you are certified as a master rain gardener. And of course, another way, um, Katie's smiling because this is her, you know, whole job is helping <laughs> people um, adopt rain gardens and take care of public rain gardens. And because that is so important, because if those public uh, rain gardens that are in the public eye look awful, then no one is going to want to put in a rain garden at their house and will be, you know, our solution to this big environmental problem is going to be stopped in its track. So helping out with a public rain garden is really important and that's another way that you can uh, earn your certification as well. Okay, so getting back to um, the plants, are there any plants that you guys know about that are super cleaners? So if you know that lots of pesticides pesticides or herbicides are getting in to your rain garden, are there specific plants that are better at cleaning that stuff up? Wow, I don't know about that. Do you know anything about that, Susan? Not I herbicides. That, um, yeah. But herbicides kill plants, so they, right. you know, this right. might be a job for biodiversity. Uh, okay. Yeah, because not it's not just the plants also, it's the soil, and having a healthy right. soil is what helps that. So um, having organic matter in the soil that supports those organisms that are, you know, so many that but this is the job of a, a soil. I mean, the soil is very complicated and there's a lot of things that live in there. Yeah. Um, and so the, if you have a healthy soil ecosystem going on, then it's more able to handle. The, I don't know specifically, but it's more able to handle those sorts of um, big Assaults. jobs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, all right, I think we talked about this one a little bit earlier, but what if you run into a lot of roots in your garden as you're digging? What should you do? I think it kind of depends on the tree. Like the one, you know, we learned, um, I'm forgetting her name, the woman on the old west side that ran into all of her tree roots that were, Pat Gomez, you know, yeah. like 75 feet away from the tree or whatever. Like that particular tree, you could hack that thing and it'd be no problem whatsoever. But if you had like a white oak tree, I wouldn't do that, you know. So, um, uh, or a, a nori maple, like any of the maples you can hack away and it's not going to get too upset um, unless it's really stressed out from other things. So um, sometimes you can just work around them and because it's a big job to try to remove the roots. Um, but a lot of times it's the little tiny ones that are actually doing a lot of the work too. So um, it kind of depends on how close you are to the tree, the type of tree. So if there's any way for you to be able to even chat in what type of tree it is, we might be able to help you think through it a little bit more sensitively. So um, yeah, and what you mentioned slightly about the tree structure, if it's like a big root coming off the tree that you can see it coming down the stem and then 
out into the yard, then you don't want to cut that root because right? Right. you could destabilize the tree. So yeah, you don't right. want to do that. But it's okay to just leave it. You know, it's yep. there you in just, the middle of the rain garden and it's fine. But just dig around it. Yeah. Just dig around it. Okay, the last question is, if you already have an existing regular garden bed that's less than 10 feet from the building and you already have a downspout into that garden, can you replace the existing garden with a rain garden that's less than 10 feet? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do I ever say no? No, you can't. No. Because you're holding <laughs> the water back. There's a difference between it flowing through and having free rain to just keep on going than it is to pond it and hold it back and ask it to go down because right now it may just be going over the top of the ground and soaking in a little bit but not very deeply but by digging a hole and holding it there you're ponding water next to your foundation and that's bad and that's bad right I mean the, I feel like when especially when I go to people's houses and I'm talking to them about their drainage issues I mean I don't even talk about rain gardens for a while. Like at the beginning, we are just solving drainage issues, and that means keeping the water away from the house. The yes. water should never pond near a house. And that, the reason is because carpentry and water do not mix. They just, yep. bad things happen. You know, the wood rots, you get water into the basement, you get mold, bad things happen. Yep. So job one is to get the water away from the house so that it's flowing soaking in in a safe place. It's okay for the water to pond. Like I'm not bothered by ponding in people's yards and things like that. It, that's really more of an inconvenience, but it should never pond next to the house. Right. Water will find its way. There will be some little crack <laughs> that it will find right. and it'll right. get down in there. <laughs> right, and you don't, you don't want that. Um, but if it is ten more than 10 feet, then you could turn no that problem. garden bed. That's right, garden. Right, and often it can be just, um, you can just expand the bed a little bit and then make yeah. a really narrow rain garden. That would be fine. There's always like a way to kind of like tweak it so that it's within the realm of the rules. Um, right. So yeah, you could just make it the bed a little bit bigger and right. make that sort of a swale right along the edge of the garden and that would work fine. Yep. Um, you just don't want like the water, the everything to be tipping towards the house and the water to be lapping up against the foundation, like no. That is, that's bad. Yep. Agreed. All right. That's all the questions. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for submitting your plans. And it is absolutely a pleasure to see your rain garden plans on the Facebook Master Rain Gardener Facebook group and on the Garden Web, web group. I love seeing your plans, and I can't wait to see the photos of your rain gardens as they're built. Thank Thanks. you so much. Stay in touch about your plants, like over time especially. We love hearing back um, about how things are doing and which things made it and which things didn't and stuff like that. So that is all really important for us to be able to have that information as we go forward. So please stay in touch. As you can tell, we're a little bit of a plant geek over here. So we want to hear all about that stuff. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for um, tuning in and enjoy the rest of your summer. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.